and kitchen tables, probably still in your pajamas. Kids, I miss you. Seeing your smiling faces on Sunday mornings is the best part of my week, and I can't wait to see you again. We are so glad you have chosen to worship with us this morning. If you're worshiping with us for the first time, we'd love to connect with you. Two ways to do that are to like our Facebook page, or you can send us a message via our Facebook page. This past week, the words, do the next right thing, have sustained and anchored me. One of my favorite authors and podcasters, Emily P. Freeman, has written an entire book about the phrase and has a weekly podcast around the simple advice of do the next right thing. For me this week, literally doing the next right thing was one way I managed my anxiety and unease. And do you know what? We managed to have a pretty good week. For us, doing the next right thing was lots of Zoom calls, figuring out how to do school at home, a new Lewis family rule that we eat ice cream every day until we ate it all, and now we're waiting to go to the store to get more, <laughs> having a campfire and roasting s'mores, a phone call with a dear friend, and releasing my need to plan weeks or months or days in the future. Instead, I tried to focus on just the next right thing. I'm so glad you have chosen your next right thing to be worshiping with us today. In her book, The Next Right Thing, Freeman talks about author Elizabeth Elliot and a poem called Do the Next Right Thing that she often quoted during her daily radio broadcast. Freeman found the poem and the original author, Mrs. George A. Paul. As we enter into worship this morning, I pray these words from the poem would quiet your soul as we prepare to worship the living God. Many a questioning, many a fear, Many a doubt hath its quieting here. Fear not tomorrow, child of the King. Trust them with Jesus. Do the next thing. We worship. Please join me in our call to worship litany. 
The Lord calls us to grow in faithfulness. Take away our greed and selfishness, O Lord. The Lord challenges us to serve others in loving ways. Help us to grow in our service and witness to your mercy and peace. Come, let us worship the Lord who delights in our witness. Let us praise God who is always with us. Amen. For a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumph of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of Thy name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of cancelled sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean, his blood availed for me. Glory to God and praise and love be ever, ever give by saints below and saints above the church in earth and heaven. reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or, if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Each Sunday in Lent, we extinguish a candle as we move closer to the darkness of Good Friday.
I invite you to pray with me this morning. Oh Lord, our God, when we in awesome wonder consider all the things you have made, we've seen the stars, we've heard the thunder in recent days, your power throughout the whole universe is displayed. And with the psalmist, we take refuge in you, and we will not be disappointed. We come to you this morning with grateful hearts, grateful for your presence, for your mercy and your love. You continue to love us in ways we couldn't measure and for reasons we cannot understand. We are grateful for your faithfulness because we confess that our faith is sometimes waning. We sometimes insist on our own ability to know best and follow our will when we know we need to surrender to yours. This is maybe never more true than when our fears make us act selfishly, when you modeled selflessness. We acknowledge the fear and chaos of the day in which we live. And so, Creator, we pray for our world, your world. We pray for those without resources, even the resources that we have here. We pray for elected leaders around the world making decisions. We pray that they would seek wise counsel and heed the best advice. There's much to not be grateful for, but when we hear the sirens of first responders going to help someone, not held back by fear for their own well-being, we are grateful. We see medical and nursing teams giving aid to those who are ill, may be diagnosed with COVID-19 or not, but putting themselves in harm's way because of their commitments and oaths, and we are grateful. We do some essential business, and when someone is still there to help us meet basic human needs, we are grateful. And with these grateful arts, we still ask for more because we pray for those who find it difficult to pray for themselves or to pray at all. We pray for those who are paralyzed by fear. We pray for those who cannot sleep or cannot eat because they are too stressed about the present or the future. Or maybe they do too much of something to self-medicate through these days. We are grateful for new children born into our faith community. We welcomed Archer Abbott DeSalvo, and now we pray for his surgery. We welcome Langston James Drumgool, who's now at home and surrounded by family. And we're grateful for wellness and well-being and ask that it continue for Jillian, Dave, Judy, Anthony, Ron, Wes, Robin, Diane, and Carol. For some of us, COVID-19 has become more personal. We pray for our friend Kent Yoey, for Karen and his family in Dallas. Give those working to restore his health from C-19 wisdom and grace, and give family who probably only want to be by his side but cannot an overwhelming sense of your peace and comfort. Loss of any kind is always hard, but in these days of sheltering in place, death still finds us. We grieve with those who have lost a loved one who cannot be publicly mourned. This is very difficult. We ask your peaceful presence with the Schroeder and Knaus families, the Hill and Means family on Nathan's death, and we continue to pray for the Diamonds and the Tillies. In these days of bewilderment, 
May we bear a strong witness to your faithfulness. For in our midst, you are our solid rock. In our storm, you are our shelter. In our uncertainty, you are our compass. In our isolation, you are our constant companion. In our need, you are our supply. You dry our tears, you hear our prayers, you work your will through anything because you are our God, yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Our New Testament reading this morning is from Galatians, the sixth chapter, verses 2 through 10. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please the flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Wildest of imagination did I ever expect or anticipate or think that I might be doing something like this in this moment, in this place, as I look out at you all but really don't see you all and, and prepare to do these kinds of things. But we're living in unexpected times, unanticipated times, and we're all experiencing a kind of March madness that we never quite saw coming. We expected the March Madness, but we never quite saw this kind of March Madness coming, and so here we are. And as I've been thinking about this in recent days, I couldn't help but think about a book that I read earlier this year by Todd Bolsinger entitled Canoeing the Mountains. Now in the book, Bolsinger uses the story of Lewis, Clark, Lewis and Clark and their famous expedition where you remember Thomas Jefferson formed this core of discovery and commissioned them to go out across the North American continent and to find the fabled Northwest Passage, this, this waterway, this water passageway that could take people from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. And they prepared for this and they put the best team together for this and they went out on this expedition with, with great preparation and all the resources they thought they might need only to come to this place in the journey that they never anticipated that they never expected, at just the moment when they thought they might be about to make a breakthrough, they came out of the woods and were faced with the Rocky Mountains. They were faced with the Rocky Mountains, and, and they realized in that moment that the terrain ahead of them was going to be different than the terrain behind them. Now, at this point in time, they had fully expected that all that was ahead of them, though varied, might be somewhat similar to what had been behind them. That the terrain ahead of them would be similar in many ways to the ways that the terrain behind them was. That the ways that they had prepared that had helped them successfully navigate the terrain behind them 
would help them anticipate and maneuver through the terrain ahead of them. But in that moment, as they, sto as they stared up at the Rockies, they realized that what was ahead would be very different than what was behind. That the terrain ahead was very different than what was behind. But in that moment, they did not buckle and they did not turn back. No, instead, they succeeded in ways they never could have before conceived. In the midst of unforeseen challenges, in the midst of unexpected and unanticipated circumstances, their true depth, their true character, their true resources, their true giftedness, their true selves were revealed. And with courage and teamwork and ingenuity, they, they dug deep and they listened to themselves and they began to listen to one another and they found in that moment that they actually were prepared. Not because of any of the preparation that they had intentionally done and not because of any of the material resources that they had brought with them, but no, they realized in that moment that they actually did have the inner resources within them and among them to move forward in all the best ways. As they listened to one another and listened to themselves, they learned to adapt and to move forward in all the ways that they needed to, all of the best ways. And what we've been facing recently is a similar kind of challenge. There's not much from any of our personal pasts that looks like what we're experiencing right now with this novel coronavirus. Things are changing quickly and the changes have been unsettling and sometimes they have also been frightening. What's happening right in front of us and what's happening all uh, around us is not anything that any of us expected or imagined. It's like coming through a forest with canoes and, and paddles expecting to put our boats down in the middle of a river that would carry us calmly on to victory only to find just as we're ready to put our canoes down that we're staring up at the Rocky Mountains with this sinking feeling inside because we left all of our high mountain hiking gear back home. How do we move forward in the midst of a challenge like this? Can we move forward well in the midst of a challenge like this? Do we have the resources that we need? Turning back is not an option. So do we have the resources that we need to move forward well in a situation like this? We do. We do because the right instincts and the right inner resources have been made available to us, offering to us all that we need to adapt well, if we're only willing to listen to them and for them. Which is, in many ways, what the Apostle Paul is calling us toward in this letter that he wrote so many years ago to the church in Galatia. The larger context of Galatians, you know, is a struggle between the past and the future. It's a struggle between the ways of the past and the ways of the future. Simply put, there were Jewish Christians in the early church who believed that people who were not Jewish, who were becoming Christian, need to become Jewish in many ways before they became faithful as Christians. That they needed to learn to obey the law of Moses well. And in response to this, Paul is saying, no! No, this isn't necessary. And Paul, in fact, Paul says the only thing that is necessary for someone to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ is faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus came and lived and died and rose again to bring about reconciliation between us and God and really us and one another. This is what Jesus did. And, and the law had been a good thing in this process. The law of Moses had been a good thing. It had acted, as Paul said earlier in the letter, as a kind of coach or guide or babysitter, shepherding us on to what was become, but to come. But the law had also done something else. 
The law had also showed us each and every step of the way how we so often fall short of God's laws and God's standards and God's ways and showed us how much we are in need of a Savior, not only to save us, but also to transform us. And this is a huge part of what makes the gospel of Jesus Christ so very good news. When we trust in Christ, we have the opportunity to enter into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And when we do this, what happens is Christ then unleashes the Spirit of God into our lives in a way that is unique and that is powerful so that we not only become newly connected to God through Christ, but in Christ we also become newly connected to Christ in a way that Christ's power and Christ's presence is in us in a new and unique way, which means, which means that we do have within us and among us by the power of God the inner resources and instincts of the spirit ready to offer us all that we need if we're only willing to listen to them and for them and to follow God's lead in them this is what God says in the letter to the Hebrews this is my covenant that I will make with them I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. And this is what Paul is saying here too, that as they and we move into the uncharted territory of God's future, they and we will need to learn to live by the instincts and the intuitions of the Spirit so that, 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 that because God has placed these things within us, we can live by the power of the Holy Spirit and listen to the instincts and the intuitions of the Spirit. And this is why in the chapter before, Paul spent so much time talking about the difference between the acts of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. He's trying to get us to learn to listen to the higher instincts of the Spirit in our life. And he knows we can buck against these instincts because... As Paul himself confessed in Romans 7, so often the things that we want to do and that we should do and that we ought to do are not the things we do. And so often the things that we don't do are the things that we should do. Paul wants us to understand that, that though we don't often live by the instincts and the intuitions of the Spirit, there is this Spirit within us, the Spirit of the living God, that is crying out and calling us to live by the higher instincts of the Spirit and the higher law of Christ. The law of love that Paul references in this chapter and in the chapter before. Paul wants us to live by the law of Christ in the way of Christ, empowered by the Spirit of Christ. Paul wants us to live by the law of Christ, in the way of Christ, empowered by the Spirit of Christ. And what is the law of Christ? Well, in Galatians 5.16, Paul says that the whole law can be summed up like this. To love our neighbor as ourselves. So that when we're loving our neighbor as ourselves, we know we're living by the higher instincts of the Spirit, the higher law of Christ. And of course, this whole Lenten series has been rooted in trying to understand that way, that higher law of Christ. Jesus said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And David Augsburger has reminded us that when Jesus said this, he wasn't doing an old thing, but he was doing a new thing. Because when he put these two laws from Deuteronomy and Leviticus together in this way, he was using it so that love of God, love of self, and love of neighbor would always now define one another. And for our purposes today, one of the most important things for us to understand in that is that we so often love God best as we love our neighbor well. And this may be one of the reasons why the second most used word for worship in the New Testament, latruo, can also be translated service. 
And that is because so often we do our best worship when we're serving our neighbor well. It's not the only way we worship, but it's one of the most significant ways we worship God by loving our neighbor well. So how do we fulfill the higher law of Christ's love in this life? What is the highest instinct of the Spirit that we can live out, and how can we do that? Well, Paul says it right here in Galatians chapter, two verse, chapter 6, verse 2. We carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. So what does it mean for us to carry one another's burdens? And what does it mean specifically right now for us to carry one another's burdens from six feet away? Well, we've seen this in so many beautiful ways in recent days. And some of you, if you're watching right now, you could even begin to comment on some of the stories, share with others of the beautiful, subtle, and large ways you've seen people carry one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. We know that so many of you have been offering ongoing prayer and uplifting scriptures for others and encouraging words and extra resources that you have in an attempt to serve others in a way that may sometimes seem small, but really are always large. You know, when you're working out in the weight room and you're, you're lifting weights and you have someone there spotting you and you're doing your reps and you, and you get stuck, if you have someone spotting you there, they don't, they don't necessarily just take the weight from you or the burden from you, which is what the weight is, but they can just, they can just do a subtle touch a subtle lifting to help you make it through that rep and go on to the next. And burden bearing in this life is so often like this. We do it in the simplest of ways. And people are doing this in wonderful ways around here. Picking up groceries and prescriptions and other needed goods for at-risk friends and neighbors and dropping them off on their porches in an effort to lift the burden just a little bit. And by the way, if you're in that at-risk group, and there are many people, not just because of their age, that are in that at-risk group, but if you're in that at-risk group and you're, you're, sort, of, you're sort of resistant to, to, to being helped, maybe in the way some folks in that at-risk group are, 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 are resistant to the word senior ever being used, if it's not in association with high school students or college students or maybe a pastor or every now and then a, a discount at McDonald's, um, what we would encourage you to do, and you know, Chip and Connie, I'm talking to you too. Um, what we would encourage you to do is, is take that help. They gave me permission to do that. That was okay. <laughs> the, the, is take that help because when you, when you let us offer you that gift of help, you're also offering us a gift as well. Because we're in this together. And in the midst of these unimagined challenges... This has been so inspiring. As we've worked with local partners to handle food and supply needs in community, many of you have been willing to step up and step in. You know, inasmuch their needs have increased, but so many of the folks that volunteer on a regular basis are on the higher end of that at-risk age group, and they've needed, rightly so, to, to stay home. So, so many of you have stepped up and stepped in and filling that void and helping others serve so that they can meet the needs of the time and carry burdens in a way that fulfills the law of Christ. And our church and staff leadership has jumped in in wonderful ways as well, quickly, and they've adapted, and, and I'm so proud. You should be so proud of our staff and our church leadership. Just a few examples, Emmett and Connie and Kim have been spearheading a rapid response team where staff and deacons and Stephen ministers and good shepherds and community group leaders and others have been working at calling every member of our congregation, starting with the most at risk in an attempt to check on needs and figure out ways that we can best carry one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And this is unfolding in so many beautiful ways. Even in this service, the fact that we're able to do this right now and even song and, and some of the children's ministry resources that have gone out online and Bible studies being offered through Zoom and other mediums, we have these incredible discipleship and technology leaders that are helping us stay connected right now. 
And it's so important for us to stay connected however we can stay connected because even as we socially distance, we don't have to completely relationally distance ourselves from one another. This is an important thing because we know we're relational beings created in the image of a relational God and we have these deep needs for relational connection. I've been inspired in so many ways. I was inspired last week because, you know, our second friend's uh, preschool has had to go ahead and shut down for the year. And, and Becky and Susie, our directors, have sent out a message to the parents and said, you know, we know this is a difficult time. Just so you know, we're not going to debit you for tuition in, in, for the rest of the year. But then they also let them know, they said, you know, if any of you would like to go ahead and pay your tuition, we just want you to know that this would be a way for you uh, to support us in paying uh, some of those teachers so that we can continue to pay our teachers. And they expected that, you know, maybe they might hear a couple of people say, yeah, yeah, you just go ahead, here's the tuition, because we want to support our teachers. But that's not what happened. What happened is the vast majority of our Second Friends families reached out and said, no, no, here's our tuition because we want to support our teachers well. People have been doing this in wonderful ways. And haven't we all been so blessed by our teachers and we've, we've all come to realize if we didn't already know how important our educators are and, and how, how much our educators have become our heroes during this time. You, you may have uh, heard about earlier in the week how many of our elementary school teachers were driving around in a parade around uh, Liberty honking their horns outside of the homes of their families to encourage them. And they're doing incredibly incredible things they they are our heroes and rightly so they they are becoming our heroes just just like others in the community who aren't normally thought of as our heroes are becoming our heroes grocery store workers restaurant workers and so many others who've had to work in person in person contact during this time and of course chief among those heroes are our medical professionals who are living their lives on the front line of this thing, putting themselves and their family members at risk. One of my best friends this past week who works in a hospital found out they, they, their son had 104.7 degrees of fever. And they had to take their son to the hospital and, and he has the coronavirus. And mom is asthmatic and grandparents who often take care of the kids can't be around, mom can't be around the kids. These are the kinds of of risks our medical professionals are taking for us as they're on the front line. You've seen the media posts where doctors and nurses who are masked are saying, "We're, we're here handling this, and the thing that you can do for us is stay home. And this right now is we know the number one way we can carry one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ is to stay home and to keep doing it with vigilance, which it seems means listening vigilantly to the higher instincts of the Spirit of God which has been placed within us. We know it's not always easy to do this. It's a bit of a struggle, but in the midst of the struggle, Paul is urging us to listen for the higher instincts of the Spirit which sometimes seem to be in competition with other instincts, our survival instincts. You know, we want to survive. We're wired to survive. It's in our biology. It's in our history. And and, and in many ways, these survival instincts have served us well lately. Our servant instincts and our survival instincts, many ways during this time, in just the right ways, have been in alignment. We stay home to survive and to help other people survive. We wash our hands to survive and to help other people survive. We keep our distance to survive and to help other people survive. We learn remotely and we work remotely to survive and to help other people survive. In these ways and others, our servant instincts have been in alignment with our survival instincts. But there are other ways. There are other ways in which our servant instincts And our survival instincts have been in competition these past days. They struggled to align. With our our economic security threatened, and this is no surprise, our survival instincts begin to kick in. 
And we've heard some suggest this past week that it would be better if we just went on back to business as usual and let this virus run its course and claim the lives that it would claim and leave the lives that it would leave, which is an instinct that I believe with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength we must suppress. And I believe we must suppress it for reasons both sensible and spiritual. Sensibly speaking, we know there is an increasing burden bearing down on our health care system. And it's important for us to remember that one of the reasons we are social distancing is to alleviate that burden. Most of us have read the statistics about how fast this virus is spreading. Most of us are aware of who is at risk the most, but it should be said that those who are most at risk are not the only one who are at risk for adverse results. It threatens us all. So practically speaking, because of the overbearing burden it could potentially have on our health care system and our health care workers, we stay home. We, we stay home to actively fight this thing from our couches. Friends, we're not being asked to storm the banks of Normandy. We're being asked to stay home so that we can actively fight this thing from our couches. Flattening the curve. Flattening the curve and keeping it contained to a level that our health care system and our health care workers can manage so that our hospitals can continue to care well for every patient. Not just those who have the virus. But those who don't, because if if our healthcare systems become overburdened with, with these patients, then they're not going to be able to care well for these patients, and we're trying to fight that from happening. So sensibly speaking, sensibly speaking, that's one of the large reasons why we stay at home. But spiritually and morally speaking, there are reasons much larger than that. Because as this virus continues to teach us, we are all so interconnected in so many ways. Our health is interconnected with people all over our planet. We are a global community. Our economy is interconnected with economies all over this planet. We have never lived in a situation where we share in a global economy in the way we do right now. We are a global community. Our lives are more interconnected with with other people in other countries on the planet more than they ever have been before, probably in the history of the world. We belong to a global community. We are interconnected. And how we carry out that connection together, how we carry that connection together, is a huge part of what it means for us to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Martin Luther King Jr. said it like this, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Because we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny, so that whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Whatever affects one indirectly or directly affects all indirectly. We're connected. We're all, as Jesus said, Neighbors, all of us. And Christ has called us to respond to all of our neighbors, all of them. Whether they be young or old, black, brown or white, non-Christian or Christian, American or otherwise, in the way of Christ. Greater love hath no one than this, that they would lay down their life for their country's economy is not what Paul said. And it is not what Jesus did either. We cannot serve both God and mammon. Jesus said mammon is our wealth. Well, mammon is our economic life. 
We cannot serve both God and mammon no matter how right it may feel. No matter how much it must push against our survival instincts because we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. And within that intertwined garment, we must never, ever, ever elevate our economic life above any human life that God has created sacred. And that means all life. No matter what it costs us financially. Because if we do that, we will not any of us ever be able to afford to pay off what it will cost us spiritually and morally. Jesus said, whatever we do or do not do unto the least of these, we do or do not do unto him. And friends, right now that ought to scare us to death. So that as we continue to wander into the uncharted and incredibly odd territory of this global pandemic, it is so important that we listen intently for the higher instincts of the Spirit, which are the deeper instincts of Christ within us. The way of Christ is the way of the suffering servant who suffered all to save all. And that's supposed to be our way too. You know, I've heard a lot of people lately throw around the word apocalypse. And that, that's, that's normal. That, that often happens when we're in situations like this. People like to throw around the apocalypse. People say we're living in the apocalypse. We're in the midst of the apocalypse. And what they usually mean when they say we're living in the apocalypse is that we're living in the last days or the end times or they're using it at least as a metaphor for something like that. But you know, that's not actually what the word apocalypse means. The word apocalypse actually literally means revelation. And I think in light of that, we are living in the midst of a kind of of apocalypse. We're going through some rough, unexpected, unimagined times. And often when we go through rough times, difficult times, stressful times, things are revealed to us about us. Struggles and suffering can be our greatest of teachers. They test our mettle in ways that reveal things to us about us. And so I think right now we are living in a kind of apocalypse. It's uncharted territory, which is causing us to struggle and to wrestle. And in the midst of this struggling, in the midst of this wrestling, things are being revealed. So what I want to ask you today is, what is being revealed to you? What is being revealed to you about you? What is it that God is revealing right now in the midst of all of this to you about you? And what is it that God is revealing to you about what God may want for you? And from you. What is it right now that to you is being revealed? We are travelers on a journey, fellow pilgrims on the road. We are here to help each other walk the mile and bear the load. I will hold the Christ light for you 
In the night time of your fear, I will hold my hand out to you, speak the peace you long to hear. Sister, let me be your servant, let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. Brother, let me be your servant. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. I will weep when you are weeping. When you laugh, I'll laugh with you. I will share your joy and sorrow till we've seen this journey through. When we sing to God in heaven, we shall find such harmony. Born of all we've known together, of Christ's love and agony. Friends, it's been so good to worship with you this morning as the body of Christ. I have a friend who's a pastor in Georgia, and what they've been saying in their congregation is, we're not worshiping at church, but we are worshiping as church. And so it has been a privilege for us to worship with you as Second Baptist Church this morning in this place. Before we sing our way out of here, uh, I want to offer these announcements. One of them, in general, is about our Easter lilies that you can still offer in memory or in honor of someone that you love, and you can do so on the hub, or you can find that link on the website, and we encourage you to do that. Today's the last day to do that. And then a couple of specific needs, some things going on right now uh, that may be relevant to you, especially in the midst of everything that's happening in our country. First of all, a new virtual pop-up community group is beginning on Thursday, April 2nd, and will meet weekly through April 23rd. The group will participate in a video Bible study together with time for prayer and reflection. You can sign up for that on the Hub. Uh, also, if your community group would like to meet uh, via Zoom in online meetings, you can contact Kim Hathill for help setting this up. This morning, in fact, we had four classes meeting during Zoom, so Bible studies are still meeting on Sunday morning and throughout the week. You can also join the Serve at Second Facebook group. If you're looking for ways to help others during this time, this is a really good way to keep up with what's going on and be connected to those needs and ways you might jump in and serve. I mentioned some of those ways. And if you, you want to know more about that, you can contact Heather Lewis if you have some questions. Also, the demand, as I mentioned earlier, at inasmuch has increased uh, because of this crisis and the virus is bringing this about in new ways. So what they've asked is please drop off food donations at inasmuch from 8 to noon on Wednesday morning. And for those who can't do the Wednesday a.m. Uh, drop off, you can leave items in the plastic bin outside of the Kansas Street Church entrance on Sunday. And those of us who are here, here will make sure that it gets to the right place. And you can download a list of needs on our website on the events page. And finally... You can volunteer it in as much on Thursdays if you want to in the drive through food pickup line by showing up on Thursdays between 10 a.m. and noon, and that's at 2050 Plumber's Way, Suite 190 in Liberty. So those are some of the ways you can connect and that you can serve right now. Friends, we love you and we miss you as we come to the end of this time together today. Hear these words. May the one who seeks you find you when you fall. May the one who loves you take delight in your living. And may the one who sends you send you now in joy. 
For in your gladness and in your grieving, in your brokenness and in your healing, in your faithfulness and in your leaving, the one who made you and redeemed you is the one who keeps you still. Amen. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Where you go, where you don't know, and never be the same. Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me?